All right. Uh, welcome to my talk about these comparative benchmarks for statistical analysis frameworks in Python. My name is Daniel, and I worked as a summer student at CERN this summer. And in this talk, I will present the main results of my project. And I was supervised by Jonas Ramser and Loren Lorenzo Moneta. So I will start the talk by introducing the frameworks I studied. And then I will explain to you the computational methods used by these frameworks in evaluating likelihoods. And then the third and one could say main part of the presentation will be that I show the benchmarking results and uh, explain a bit what we can see there. And then since this talk got upgraded to a notebook talk, I will try to show you some of my of how I implemented the analysis in different uh, frameworks. So I didn't upload any of these notebooks to the binder as it was, and I wasn't able to set up root there. So instead, I will just be showing them via screen, sh uh, screen share. And yeah, that's mainly meant so you get a, can get a feeling for the usability of the different packages and how easy it is to implement an analysis. And in the end, I will quickly summarize my results and give an outlook over how the benchmark can be further improved. So the first framework that you now should all know is Hist Factory. And as it was just explained, it's an implementation of Hist uh, Sorry, it's PyHF. And it's an implementation of Hist Factory in Python. And there are multiple available backends. And um, yeah, the interface of PyHF, as we've just seen, is rather high level. So we can quite easily and quickly have a running code that produces some results. Then another framework that was also already presented in this workshop is ZFIT. And Jonas Eschler presented it on Monday. And this library is mostly focused on unbind fits, which is also how I used it in this benchmark. And instead of having multiple backends, this uh, framework is based on TensorFlow. And finally, there's RuFit as part of the root uh, framework. This is a bit of di bit different from the other two, as it's um, originally a C++ library, but it can be used through Python bindings in Python. And it can perform both bind and unbind fits, which is why I compared it in the benchmarks to the two other um, frameworks. Yes, and in Rufit, in the last few years, um, um, so in the last few years, there have been a few backends implemented um, to Rufit so that different backends can be compared. Now, uh, the default evaluation methods of likelihoods in Rufit is um, that we just have an outer loop over all the events and we evaluate a computation graph for our likelihood each time. And to somewhat improve the performance, we've reduced to cache intermediate results so that when some par parameters are varied, not all nodes of the computation graph need to be re-evaluated. Re and um, an upgrade to this is the was a CPU backend that introduced a vectorization so that the computations of the graph can be vectorized over many events at once. And depending on which hardware is used, there's also an auto vectorization due to the compiler. Um, then a third backend is CUDA that allows Root to use the CPU, uh, its GPU. So CUDA kernels are launched to compute the likelihood. And a CPU can be used in parallel for some computations. And the newest backend that was added to root is the code gen backend. In this backend, first some minimal C code for the likelihood is compiled on the fly. And then through um, yeah, through CLAT, an automatic differentiation of this minimal code or of these functions can then be performed that can save time later on when trying to find a gradient, for example, of our likelihood for minimization or maximization. Yeah. And of course, it, and in code gen, then there's no longer any caching of intermediate results as, as we just treat the computation graph differently. Yeah. So PyHF also has backends. And in PyHF, it's usually different Python libraries, like 
at per default, you would, would often use NumPy, where all the values are saved in arrays, which in NumPy arrays, which adds a kind of um, vectorization to the computation. As yeah, you can run all computations on NumPy arrays and with NumPy methods. Um, then another backend or possible package to use is TensorFlow, the machine learning framework originally. And as a machine learning framework, it's of course uh, deals a lot with um, computing gradients. So here, gradient tape can be used to com to um, make automatic differentiation. And also, TensorFlow has this accelerated linear algebra, which can optimize the computation graph so that it runs faster. Um, yeah, similarly, PyTorch as a machine learning framework can be used. Um, it also has these NumPy-like arrays to allow some vectorization, and it has automatic differentiation with autograd in this case, it's a program that is used. And the fourth and newest um, backend is JAX. So JAX contains an updated version of autograph for automatic differentiation. It also has this accelerated linear algebra for code optimization and some auto vectorization is possible to improve the performance. Now, when I want to talk about my benchmarking results, it's useful to first look at what I implemented. And what we can see on, see on the right is the likelihood function of measuring some histogram when a theoretical prediction is given as a signal and background template histograms. So it's the likelihood for a template histogram fit. And then exclusion limit setting can be done through some asymptotic formula that I linked to here. And in this formula, we will need um, the likelihoods of some given signal strength mu, for example. And we will also need likelihoods of best fit results. So we will need to do some fitting. And this fitting is yeah, the, part, the part of our program that consumes a lot of time. And that is what we actually what I actually wanted to benchmark in my project. And the fitting is performed with Minui 2, which is available both in Wilfit and ZFit and PyHF. And to ensure that the benchmark is fair, all parameters like the strategy or the tolerance or starting values are set to be the same in both on all implementations. And when we when we do some fitting to get best fit values, we will not need the error estimations on these best fit values, which means that the Hesse matrix uh, doesn't need to be uh, yeah, evaluated and computed in our fit, which is why we turned that off, but also improving the um, performance of all implementations. And it was, and then, then I actually verified that both in Rufit and in IHF, the minimizer, so mean we, was called, this, called the same number of times. So there was no different, no difference in how often mean we was called. So all remaining differences are in the likelihood evaluation. Yes. So now here we see the first benchmark. This benchmark was run on a Intel Core i7 6700. Uh, CPU and it had four cores that were only used in multi-threading by PyTorch and JAX. The other backends didn't use any multi-threading. They didn't specify whether the backends should use it or not. And what and the quantity that I varied in this benchmark is the number of bins in my histogram. So we see for especially for few bins, the two backends or the backends with automatic differentiation are the slowest. So we see the um, backends based, so all, all the um, machine learning frameworks as backends, and we also see code gen that have a large overhead. And we see that the, especially Rufit CPU and the legacy backend are the fastest of few bins. Um, yes. And but in the end, we see that actually Jax um, yeah, overtakes, so Jax becomes faster. And in, and for many bins, so around a hundred bins, Jax is the fastest uh, tested evaluation backend, which shows us that at that point the overhead is no longer dominant, but 
the auto automatic differentiation, for example, um, yeah, really pays off in reducing our performance. And yeah, in general, so the largest overhead is in TensorFlow and CodeGen. And we see a small change between the roofed backends of CPU and of our legacy, because in the beginning for very few bins, we see that a roofed is fastest when not even using the vectorization of the CPU backend. But then for more bins, we get more parameters in our fit. And then at some point, the CPU backend and the vectorization pays off. Yeah. So that's the main takeaways from this benchmark. And we also did a benchmark varying not the number of bins in our histogram, but the number of channels. So usually in a physics analysis, we can have multiple channels, so multiple, in a way, separate histograms that we all measured and then combined to, to find some results with more statistics. And what we see here as a main result is that the PyHF backends become rather slow for many channels. And looking into it, we found that there's a loop in Python code that um, iterates over all the channels, which leads to a reduced performance for many channels. And interestingly, we see, for example, that between the CPU and of legacy backends of Wilfrid, there's no change in performance since the vectorization doesn't happen between different channels, but only within each channel. And then the resulting likelihoods get combined in the end. Yes. Then uh, it also did an unbind benchmark, especially of Wilfrid and Zfit. There I had an analytical function that described the data in the model. And we can see it on the right so we have this just nine Gaussian peaks with different um, and then I fitted the function to the sample values. So that's a fit converged. And yeah, again, Minui, the Minui options are set identical, identically for both for all frameworks. And this time we do com calculate the Hessel matrix because we are in, usually in such a fit interested in the best fit values and their errors. Again, we have the same number of minimization calls. And now a special, a special thing about TensorFlow and ZFit is that ZFit doesn't have multiple backends to choose between, but instead we can have some options within TensorFlow. So for example, we had the, we talked, uh, I told you that TensorFlow has this accelerated linear algebra that can optimize our computation graph before using it, but we can turn this optimization off and run in a gradient that is used can either be provided by TensorFlow with its automatic differentiation, or it can be provided by Minui itself. And looking at this uh, benchmark, it was run on a this time an AMD Ryzen 9 CPU, and no multi-threading was used by any of the backends or any of the frameworks. And yeah, this time the variable that we changed was the number of events sampled from the distribution. So in the left of the plot, we see that we sampled only about 100 events, which is of course not that much data for nine Gaussian peaks. And in the end, we had about 2 million events sampled. Um, yes, we can again see the large overhead in TensorFlow and CodeGen. And we, in, when we compare the legacy backend and the CPU backend of Wilfred, we can nicely see the effect of our vectorization because already in the beginning, the CPU backend is faster. And in the end, it's more than one order of magnitude that we that it, the performance is improved. Uh, yeah, and at this time, even the code gen backend and all the um, all the ZFit based fits are faster in the end than the legacy will fit. So the auto differentiation also really pays off, and is more important than the overhead for 
about a million or two million events. Yes. And when we look at the different ZFIT options, then we see that, that between the using the gradient from uh, TensorFlow or Minui, there's hardly any, any difference. So it's in the order of magnitude of one second, maybe, that it gets faster by using the uh, TensorFlow provided uh, computation uh, the, the gradient. But when we use the eager mode, we see a large difference. So we see about an order of magnitude slower when the computation graph is not optimized. And in the end, we see a nice identical linear behavior for all our um, frameworks. So we can hope that this that um, there won't be any major changes in which is fastest if we look at more events. Then TensorFlow can also be run on a GPU, which allows us to do that as well on an NVIDIA RTX A4500. And there we can compare to the CUDA backend that we didn't look at so far in Wilfred. We see that it has uh, less overhead than, than TensorFlow, but uh, we see some interesting behavior at around uh, 30,000 events. That is because the backend can handle around 512 events at once with a total of 52 streaming processors. And if we multiply that, we come, we find that about uh, that after about 29,000 to 30,000 events, uh, some serialization is needed in Wilfred, which could explain the sudden increase of time at that point, because suddenly it needs to do some serialization. But what we see when we compare these GPU results to the CPU results we previously saw, then we see that only at around 1 million events does the GPU outperform our CPU, which, in, which indicates that it might be interesting to look at this benchmark with even more events to see uh, possible future changes in the GPU performance. So we see all the curves are mostly flat, even around 2 million events. So the increase due to more events can hardly be seen. Yes. Um, now I would like to quickly uh, show you um, the implementation. Um, um, yes. So here, for example, we see, as you've probably seen already just a few minutes ago, how uh, the simple hypothesis test can be implemented in PyHF. So we see we just have to include PyHF. Then in this case, I just read a workspace from a JSON file that I created. And then here in just like five lines, or four lines, actually, we can do the very simple hello world like uh, test and get some CLS values. When we want to do the same in Wilfred, it gets much more complicated. So again, here's some function for reading a workspace that will that is not that important right now. But what we need is we need a separate function to create. So we need some about some wrapper for minimizing like uh, block likelihood um, values. And I needed to create some post fit Asimov values, which is already included in IHF. Um, and then here I have a function that um, get, finds the best fit values from the ne negative log likelihood. So by performing the fit, we get the best fit values and the likelihood for these values. And then from the paper that I had for the asymptotic formulas, we can calculate some quantity Q tilde. So the test statistic, and then we can find some um, CDF, so a cumulative distribution function, probability distribution function, and then the CLS values. So we needed to implement a lot of functions that were already included in IHF. And then the real hypothesis test is finding our Asimov data and then getting the CLS values. And then finally, we can also have our code in, yeah about five to 10 lines. But of course, for a new user, it's a lot of overhead to first have to um, implement all the above mentioned functions. 
which is a somewhat of a win for IHF because it's so much easier to get the results without a, without spending days or weeks in, in on implementing the analysis. Now, when we look at the unbind FIPS in ZFIT, for example, we again import ZFIT and then we can have some function that samples our data from a random distribution and we need to define a model. So for example, we can define se several ZFIT parameters like the mu and the sigma of a Gaussian. And then we can do a sum PDF to add our Gaussians in this case. And in the end, we get our model. And then the fitting itself, it creates a log likelihood, take log likelihood and minimizes it. And here we can then define some observable number of events, data and model and do the fit. And if we do this, then we can see that it finds all our different values. Oh, okay. So uh, this is because I already ran this before and uh, that fit doesn't deal well with name with double naming variables. But maybe while this runs, I can show you the same implementation in root. This time it looks very similar because we have a function. So we sample our random numbers from a distribution. We define our model from real variables instead of parameters as they were called in that fit, but it's almost the same. And then we do an add PDF, some PDF to add our Gaussian distributions. In fitting, we first create our NLL, so an native block likelihood, then we minimize it. And then in the end, again, we create the observable data model, and then we can perform the fit. I think in that fit, yes, and that fit it now works. And here we see that the minimizer was called about 450 times. And here are our final values, which are quite similar to what we input in our distribution. So I hope this quick overview gave, this gave you a quick overview over the usability and for, especially for example, that in rule fit we um, need, it's much more difficult for a new user to implement, for example, the hypothesis test. So now to summarize it, if anyone wants to see the full code or we create these benchmarks, you can have a look at my repository. And a possible outlook to yeah, do further work on this benchmark would be, for example, to include more models. So for example, there's, you could have custom PDFs with an unknown analytical integral, which means that the frameworks need to calculate the numerical integral, which might change the performance quite significantly. You could also add more frameworks. So of course, some of the biggest frameworks are already included, but for example, there's one called GooFit, which is also C++ based and for the people who want to use Wolf, it might be an interesting comparison how other people implemented the same methods in, in C++. And there was an idea in the Wolf team of automizing regular benchmarks through GitHub Actions, meaning that, for example, every time there's a new stable release of Wolf, these benchmarks are performed so that changes in the performance can be spotted early on. Yeah, and the main results of this project is that we now have these comparative benchmarks between the frameworks. And I took a lot of effort to really validate that the comparison is as fair as possible. And I hope that I didn't spot, miss anything. So I really hope this is a fair comparison that yeah, doesn't suffer from me misusing some of the programs or using them inefficiently. So I thank you for want to thank you for for your attention and I think since I started like four or five minutes late, we have a few minutes for questions. Yeah, exactly. So thanks a lot for this very interesting comparison. So yeah, um, we have a couple of minutes for questions. So I see uh, Matthew has raised his hand. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, well. Sorry, maybe we should actually do Luigi first because he actually asked his question before me. Um, All right, yeah, there's a question in the chat from Luigi. Um, so um, he's asking what the number of events is on, yeah, I guess he's asking about the x-axis. Yeah, um, so what I did here was I defined my analytical function, so the uh, probability distribution function in this case as these nine Gaussians. And then I drew some number of events from that distribution so I 
So for example, when we see here that we have around 10 to the two events, that means that I had a sample of just 128 uh, random numbers and I fitted my analytical function to this rather small sample. So I hope that. Yes, thanks. thanks. Okay. Yeah, then we can go to Matthew Beck. Yeah, um, Daniel, thanks very much for both the, the nice talk as well as this uh, this work. It's I think it's really great to see. Uh, so thank you for being uh, you know for doing this. Um, I guess uh, a couple of questions, uh, maybe about the work in general is, um, so you uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you did this just well as a summer student, correct? So it was a bit under three months of time. Okay, fantastic. Um, are do you have uh, I not to interrogate you about your plans, but but are are you, are you planning on continuing kind of working with uh, the root team in general, or is uh, is this or is this sort of work that you, you might uh, continue being a maintainer for, or is this a project that you're going to hand off? Um, so for my master thesis that I officially am about to start pretty much now, I will work back in um, yeah, physics analysis at Atlas. So at, at least for now, I will not be working in the root team officially. I think okay. I do some maintaining of my repository, but I think the idea was yeah. also that uh, other people, okay, for example, Jonas might have a look at yeah, but Sorry, I didn't mean to keep cutting you off there. Um, oh, okay, great. Uh, thanks to for mentioning that in the chat. But it's it's great to know that this is also something that will be available uh, publicly for people to discuss on and such. Um, so yeah, this is super great to see again. So thanks. Um, I had uh, so I correct me if I might have missed it, but um, so you showed comparisons on the GPU for between Zedfit and uh, and and uh, and Rufit, but did you have a slide for the uh, GPU comparisons for the the bind models? Um, in the bind models, I didn't perform a benchmark on the GPU. Okay. Yeah, it was mainly because the CUDA backend is also quite was quite work in progress and is rather new. So ah, at, okay, okay. That point, at the point when I was implementing the benchmark, actually the BIMT model didn't work with the CUDA backend. Okay, great. Um, yeah, and then I it's uh, I'll, I'll be real quick. Uh, I'm not su super surprised to see that uh, with using the Minui optimizer for everything, uh, that things are maybe a bit slower. Uh, we usually recommend that people try and start with uh, some of the other optimizers. And then once they found some nice model parameters, they switch to uh, Minui. But um, uh, yeah, this, this is this is overall great to see. And so uh, I'll, I'll defer to Luigi now for other talks, but um, I'll follow up with you on email. So thank you very much for this. Thanks for the feedback. Yeah, maybe you can take one quick question from Luigi. Yes, it, it's going quick, but we can also follow offline if that takes too long. I was just wondering, maybe you said it, uh, I missed it, but, but would it be interesting or have you tried um, performing the same comparison uh, bearing the number of parameters in a model? Um. So for the for Zfit in this case? Yes, or, for example, yes. Um, so what I did for that fit is, so what we are, what we are seeing here is this model with the nine edit portions. So with a total of 18 parameters, I also performed it with, so I tried to recreate some of the models that Jonas Eschler used a few years ago in one of the original papers on that fit. And there was also a model where you basically just have one Gaussian, so just two parameters. But in this, I think actually now that I think about it, I should have uh, have it back here. Yeah. So these are the results of just having like two parameters, meaning just one Gaussian. And here we see somewhat similar behavior with the main difference that, for example, the error bars are larger, but we still see 
with similar behavior um, mostly. Okay, okay, thanks. I, I guess it would be interesting maybe, yes, for people that, uh, and yeah, maybe sometimes have to deal with, with very complicated models with a lot of parameters and maybe be interesting to understand whether maybe the picture looks different in that case. But okay, thanks for the answer. Also, as uh, Jonas just said in the chat, for our BIND models, we had one uncertainty parameter per BIN, so the number of BINs was proportional to the number of parameters. There we have some variation of how many parameters we have. And one person in the chat asked whether I can upload my slides. Uh, I will do that. I just currently have a problem where the CERN SSO won't let me sign into Indico. So once that is fixed, I'll upload the slides. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot. Yeah, that would be very much appreciated. Yeah, slides, and then we can maybe follow up a bit on you know, Slack if you also want to join that. I mean, yeah, the, the, the question about the parameters, parameters would also have been my question. So I think this, especially the auditive benchmarks, I think, for, for PyHF in the past have shown that uh, you really gain only when, when you have a large amount of parameters. You can save a lot on function evaluations when you get gradient with respect to all the parameters at once. Okay, thanks a, thanks a lot.